We, uh, as a company, have been in the nuclear market for quite some time. We're up and running. Um, GE Touchy is the nuclear leg. Sorry about that. Uh, nuclear leg of GE, and um, uh, in this region we have uh, experience in BWRs, but more so in the Nordics uh, as well as in Germany here in Europe. And uh, it was one of the uh, leading design in you, as as many of you know. Uh, what happened the last couple of years is that the market has grown. So my role has changed from being a uh, salesperson in fuel and uh, services into the more new exciting things that we're all here to talk about today. My name is Fredrik Wittabeck. I'm based in Sweden. I've been with GE for 10 years and uh, the last couple of years I've been just touring, talking to people and many of you uh, about our new SMRs. So the, my lead, my lead uh, picture here is the uh, evolution of uh, a, a way to think that has occurred inside GE. Um, a couple of years ago, we were really unsuccessful with a large unit. Uh, it did never make it to the market. It's called ESBWR. Uh, we were in, that was in a time also when after Fukushima, the market actually went belly up. There was nothing to do. Uh, so we took a couple of hard decisions. Uh, to reduce staff and was thinking about doing nuclear at all from a new build standpoint. This resulted in a um, due diligence of what is needed. We went out to customers, we did um, um, ask them what would you require from us in order to order a new unit and the first response was it needs to be controlled in schedule and in cost and we all echo that here today. Uh, and it needs to be a bite size that I can handle it. You shouldn't be able to back it up with a military or a sovereign um, responsibility. It should be a business decision. So bite size was suggested to be a billion. And um, the, uh, the technology should be able to be deployed over a mandate period of a president or a CEO, which is three to four years. So that's what we went to the drawing board with. As you see behind me, that's the design that came out. And what we did was basically said that we can't do anything else than reusing our old, proven, uh, viable technology in order to reach that goal. But we also probably need to come up with a solution that, that utilizes it in a better way. And you can read all about it on our web page. We have much information available about it. Uh, and if you don't find it, please contact me afterwards and I will make sure that you get it. But the bullets here is the main thing that I want to communicate today. So the X in the BWRX 300, that stands for number 10, which is the 10th evolution or generation of our proven technology. We have continued to work on the safety case. Uh, it's increasingly safety. I don't really need to talk about that. Uh, because we all know that nothing's going to get to the market without uh, fulfilling the safety requirements. But it's improving in safety as well. We are basing our design on the ESBWR, uh, which is a licensed uh, product, and it has rendered a significant uh, reduction in the cost of capital. And the design change that I mentioned before was uh, that was triggering most of the reduction in the cost is actually an integrated valve. And this integrated valve have made us reduce the footprint. So I think right now we are below 50% uh, less concrete per megawatt uh, than our previous versions. And that's basically the average on if you compare it to other large units as well. Uh, it's ideal uh, for electricity and industrial applications. Being inside GE, it's, it's kind of neat because when you get a product like the X300 that promises to have a different uh, commercial uh, message and a, a, a format, uh, a lot of the adjacent technology becomes uh, potential to commercialize. So right now we have application inside house, if I say house, meaning GE, for heat extraction. So we can provide that to, to district heating or industrial ap application. But we also can use that for DAC, which is direct air capturing. 
Um, that could be a feed source together with hydrogen into perhaps the drop-in fuel that we heard about earlier. Um, and we can do that at today economical uh, levels and in a sufficient and needed scale. So that's the bolt-on that we're working on that will be coming to the market uh, together with our product. It doesn't mean you have to use it like that, but it's definitely providing an added value. We have a small footprint. Uh, we're working to get this technology closer to the end user because we believe that's where society wants us. So that's key for us to get it in there. Uh, I th we're hoping to get it uh, down to the industrial uh, fence line and not the EPC uh, set that is currently uh, in most uh, regulatory regimes. And we are working now together with um, a couple of customers, uh, uh, one predominantly in, in uh, Canada, OPG, many of you have read about it, and they are uh, targeting to have the first operational unit uh, 2028 uh, as early, and, and we are supporting that schedule. Uh, hope to have some news about that fairly shortly, uh, shortly. and uh, in addition to the Canadian project, we have, um, we have more uh, North American projects recently, Saskatchewan was announcing their interest in our design. We have agreement with TBA that we are actively working on, uh, and that's the one that we have been, been public with. Uh, here in Europe, we are advancing the discussions now for, uh, it's not a unit uh, deployment in Poland, it's a program where our customer and partner there have announced uh, a um, contract with for one of the long lead materials, uh, the vessel of 10 units to start with. So this is, this is not something that we're taking to the market we ha we, uh, in the future, we are doing it now. So it's ongoing. It's in the late 20s and I hope, really hope that we can have uh, one of these technology or units here in Europe, uh, similar time frame, definitely way before 2030. I'm running out of time, even if I have few slides. And uh, I, sorry, okay, thanks. So, so uh, this this picture here is is to uh, uh, basically say, don't trust Frederick. See what GE did before. Uh, this is the ABWR timeline. When we took that to the market, uh, the first unit was built in 38 months. Second, a bit longer. Third one, and fourth one and fifth one was a bit longer. And the reason for that was because we were added some seismic needs that needed to be recalculated, but the building time was about the same. So they added some engineering time to that. So this is, if you know what the ABWR sized reactor is, and we did it uh, below four years, uh, this is what modularization and experience uh, can do. And we're aiming to beat those numbers quite aggressively. And uh, the first units is probably closer to or below three years. And we're working to get that down even further. So if I, wanna leave, if I can leave you with just one thing before my extra minute uh, vanishes. It's the, uh, right now we're in a situation where policy decisions are made really, really fast. And I'm not sure if all of them are sufficient if they're going to stay the same way uh, or not. And I think whatever decision that occurs needs to be based on a future that is not reactive, that is proactive. So we're trying to keep our commercial product commercial, even in a future where we have more naturalized, more uh, humane energy prices. So if by investing in this, you shouldn't end up in a situation where you require uh, governmental support in 10 years because the gas market has imploded or something. We, we, will, we will aim to compete at that neck to neck anyway. Thank you.